What's going on, everybody? Happy Wednesday. I hope you guys are having a great day, a great week. I uh, hope you're having a great spring, summer, wherever you are. We have a truly world-class episode for you today. Brian Baumgartner is with us today. You might know him as Kevin from The Office. He's just really a great guy, delightful human being. He's even better than you might remember Kevin being. And that's hard <laughs> to say because we all love Kevin, but... Uh, Brian is here to share his fun and uh, stories about The Office, what it was like for him to move to L.A., some behind-the-scenes the stories of, of filming the show or just his own personal experience. It's one of the greatest uh, sitcoms of all time. It's so fun to hear these stories. Also, just great to know. It's also just great to get to know Brian as a person, and uh, we talk about life and his experiences. I had such a, a fun time with Brian. I'm sure you will have a more fun time listening to our conversation. Can't thank you enough for tuning in, subscribing, rating five stars for those people who do. So don't forget to send in your questions at asknick at castmedia.com, cast with a K. Oh, by the way, our favorite people on the team, Chrissy, Amanda, and Allie are with us. <laughs> I hope you guys Hi, are doing Nick. great. Are we just have we like uh, the like we got Brian, you were in a groove, you were in a flow, you were going. Brian were going. and I have so much good. to talk about, and I know all these people love to hear our stories, but you want to get to the meat of the conversation, which is Brian Baumgartner. So don't forget to uh, again rate, subscribe, review, all that fun stuff. Can't thank you enough for listening. Without further ado, Brian Baumgartner. Thanks for coming, Brian. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm so excited to talk to you today. So you, uh, we were, were chatting before we got everything set up. You, uh, you were, you've been tra you've traveled all over the country. Yes. And you were a theater guy b before you were in comedy. I was. Yes. And really, quite frankly, didn't even focus on comedy. Um, I was uh, made a joke. <laughs> like I, I did way more like check off than like regular comedy. So, uh, yeah. I, I, I went to uh, SMU in Dallas. They had a conservatory uh, training program within the university and then left there and started doing theater and and kind of did, there's like a regional theater circuit, which no one will even know what that means. Like if they, if in your own town, there'll be like one big theater, you know, like in Atlanta and uh, Chicago and Minneapolis, San Francisco, La Jolla. And so there was, was kind of a circuit. So I would travel around doing shows at different theaters. Some would travel from theater to theater and um, and a, a few touring shows. And that was, yeah, that was my life pre coming to Los Angeles. When did you come out to LA? I came out to LA in uh, 2003. So I went from doing theater and decided, uh, well, I, so this is like, it's a, you're, it's not cool to say this, but I, <laughs> I actually loved LA. I loved, I'd come out a few times. <laughs> I, I, okay. I love, I just well, loved there you it. would think New York. Yes. No, I know. And I really, and I, I worked in New York. I love New York. When you're doing theater, traveling around the country, you, you, by definition, don't have very much money. And for me, New York is just, it's really only fun if you if you can afford it. Sure, uh, at least for me, I never had that itch out of college to like go to New York or L.A. and 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 do that. Like I, the working was really important to me, and I felt like I needed to do some stuff and establish myself before making a move. But I I really loved Los Angeles. It took me way longer than I kind of thought it would to come um, because I I was. I did have opportunities to do shows and it was essentially me saying, okay, I'm going to stop working and I'm going to just go to Los Angeles and I'm going to try my hand at that. And then within a couple of months of moving here, I met uh, Greg Daniels and Ben Silverman and the folks on the office. So you're only here for a couple of months. I was only here for a couple of months, but don't get that smug smile off of your face because was like, it was fucker. No, wait, no, <laughs> no, but no, no but, but you were in theater for so yes. long. Yes, I mean, yes. yeah. In fact, I tell the story. The first show I did out of college, my parents were incredibly supportive. I mean, incre they could not have been more supportive of me and what I wanted to do. The first show that I did out of college um, was in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And 
uh, in February, and my parents came out to see it, and it was like, are we going to cancel the show tonight? Because it was like negative 15 degrees in this <laughs> small theater. And my parents showed up, and there were 15 people in the audience. And they were they were they had a positive forward front to me, but they have shared with me probably years later that their car ride back to their hotel that night was what in the fuck is he doing? What is he doing? <laughs> like this is why there's no one that what he can't make a live at what is this? This can't be it for him. This cannot no. <laughs> yeah, he should move back home and become a doctor or whatever. I don't know. But they were always incredibly supportive, but but secretly they had they had thoughts. Yeah, that's that's really interesting because we've had conversations before about like we're as parents like where do you find the line between just being like hey <laughs> right. you know like maybe <laughs> something else or just you know supporting their in, them in their dream because to do something great you have to everyone has that story or some version of it, right? And like to your point, yeah, you got to LA and, and a couple months later, but you paid your dues by traveling the country and going to these small towns and sometimes having 15 people in the audience or, you know. And, right. And that, I mean, most people would quit right. just to see 15 people. I mean, that's nowadays we expect you know, instant gratification is such a, a, a big deal. Right. When you look back on that moment, did you agree with your parent? Not, well, not agree, but did you have the same fears? I don't know. Like I, I, I am not someone who started out. I, I mean, I certainly did not start out wanting to be famous. Okay. Like that was, that was not a part of it for me or the celebrity part. It truly was about, the work and about creating characters. You just love doing and it. I just love doing it. And you talk about instant gratification because, you know, in a way that live theater experience and having like truly in the moment mm -hmm. people responding, to me there is nothing like it. It is so difficult. I mean, it is so true, like, you know, because by the end, you know, and I was working in, in bigger theaters by the end, but still it's, it's eight shows a week. Your one day off is Monday. Who has Monday off? Like, there's no like your life. Like, hey, well, who wants to hang out? Everyone's yeah. like, no, it's Monday. Who wants a day off? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you're like, you end up just trying to catch up on laundry and bills and everything else from the week, and um, it, it it is it is incredibly incredibly difficult. But I I loved it, and and it really was about that for me. And I think I don't know what what would have happened if I didn't particularly like LA or, you know, if that wasn't a decision that I wanted, you know, that I made or wanted to do, like how long I, I would have stuck it out. But I, I never had any doubts. No, I never had that. And, and again, I, I will say for my parents, like they never, to me, they never expressed those doubts either. They were always fully supportive. Um, and, uh, you know, for me pursuing what I wanted to do. It's summertime, people, and no better time to get yourself in the shape that you want to be in and be the healthiest version of yourself. And you can do that with our friends at Noom, based in science and built by psychologists. Noom doesn't give you rules, but instead teaches you how to think so you can accomplish your personal health goals and stick with them long term to get healthy for good. If you want to get healthy and stay healthy, you need to know more about how to make those decisions. And Noom gives you the knowledge, tools, and confidence to make strategic choices that turn into long-term habits, and those long-term habits turn into healthier happier you. Noom's cognitive behavioral approach means you're not just improving your health, but you're gaining the knowledge and habits that you need to stay healthy. 80% of Noomers finish the program and over 60% have stuck with their goals for over a year. I love using Noom. I use it a, uh, every day, just 10 minutes a day to get the information I want to, you know, sometimes I want to build muscle mass, stay leaner, or just have overall good wellness. There is science into getting healthier. It's called Noom. Sign up for your trial today at Noom, N-O-O-M.com slash B I A L L. Learn how to get healthy with Noom. Sign up for your free trial today at Noom, N O O M dot com slash V I A L L.
Hey everybody, everyone wants to be an expert, but very few of us are because we're not taking advantage of the resources we have available in front of us. Masterclass is an amazing resource for those people who want to get better at literally anything. If you want to maybe be a better athlete and have the right mindset, well, Wayne Gretzky, the world's greatest hockey player of all time, is here to <laughs> teach you how to do so. And maybe it's dog training, it's cooking, photography, making a movie, film. The list goes on of the incredible people out there teaching you world-class people teaching you how to get better at whatever it is that you want to be a master in. I highly recommend you check it out. I love Masterclass. I've given it as gifts. I've given it as a gift to myself. Get unlimited access to every Masterclass and Biofile listeners get 15% off an annual membership every Masterclass they have in the Rolodex. And let me tell you, it's a lot. Go to masterclass.com slash V-I-A-L-L. That is masterclass.com slash V-I-A-L-L for 15% off Masterclass. Amanda... Uh, told me she did some extensive research that you had an injury as a child where you ended up in a wheelchair. That is a, that is true. Was so, that like a? I feel like that would be an adversity that that would shape you. A hundred percent. And I think that yeah. So so if, if we sort of rewind back, I like if I had a, an early dream, it was that I was going to be a professional baseball player. Like that okay. was what I was going to do. Yeah. And and at that point, I mean, you know, who knows? But that that was uh, I was very I mean, all sports, really. But baseball was kind of it for me. And um, I had a uh, I had a, a my bone was twisted in my leg from birth. Right. This was the kind of thing I could have lived with forever. So my 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 foot was slightly rotated from my knee. So like if, like some people are like pigeon toed sure, or whatever. Okay. I was the opposite of pigeon toed. I don't count. I don't even remember what it's called now. This is something and it wasn't dramatic, but it was it was something I could have lived with. Yeah. But if you want to be a professional baseball player, it's not gonna no, yeah. you need everything aligned and yeah. be able to run fast or whatever. So a very long story, but to make it a, as short as possible, I. I went in and, and electively, um, as a teenager, had they did a procedure which was essentially, <laughs> sorry if you're eating, severing the bones, both the tibia and the fibula in the leg, aligning the foot, putting, you know, like if someone has a sure. sports injury now, putting uh, screws and bolts in there, making it set, then you go back in a year later or whatever and you take those out and now you've got an aligned foot and that was that was the plan. Well, something went wrong, and um, apparently I'm in some medical journals or something like that. I, this was like the first time this had happened, but the first claim to fame. What exactly? <laughs> exactly. So you know, a splint is like a cast, and yeah. a cast gets very hot, and then it cools, and that's when it hardens. It's also there's a lot of chemicals in there. I don't. I'm not a doctor. Talk to somebody else. But basically, what happened was they did the surgery. They put the splint on, the cast on, to keep the leg in place. And there was either some chemical mismixture or the cast got really hot at the pressure point. If you imagine my leg is propped up, then the edge of the, my foot wasn't in a cast. The edge of the cast was, was down by you know, my ankle and something went wrong. But for days I was experiencing pain and they were like, mm, yeah, he's fine. Give him some morphine or whatever. And then eventually they were like, well, he shouldn't be feeling this. So they cut the cast off and it had burned through my Achilles tendon um, <gasps> at, at the back of my leg. So oh. this now, an elective surgery to try to solve a situation, created. created a situation where I had to learn to walk again. There was skin grafts, there was, and yeah, there was, I, I have the an old- The cast was burning through your body while it was on you for days? No, I think it did it, it, it did it, and then it was just there and I was on drugs and it was under the cast. So it was like, oh my God. yes, whatever, festering in there. I don't know what, oh my um, God. but yeah. So it, they, um, I had a, I have a friend years later, I went to one junior high. And then when I went to high school, um, and this was all going on around that time that I showed up one year, like at high school and he, he joked years later, he was like, I thought it was like a miracle, man. Like I, he thought I like couldn't walk again. That I was, <laughs> but yeah, I was basically in a wheelchair. I had a walker, you know, as a fifteen-year-old, whatever it was. Um, yeah. So um, 
but I was a very active kid. So I, I was playing tennis, uh, basketball, baseball. Those were kind of the big three that I was doing. And um, I needed to find something else. It was, I mean, it was really about that. Like, because I was an active kid and now those things I couldn't do. So that's almost how you got into. And that's how I got into to, theater. Like, yeah. that's how I initially got, got into it, was just trying to find something that I could do. What a, what a blessing! I mean, because that's crazy. Uh, I was in high school. I was a big athlete, and you know, I kind of i I was into art too. And as a defiant child, my art teacher told me to quit sports and focus on art. And so I was like, "Fuck you! I'm quitting art and focusing on sports." And I had a good, I had a you know successful athletic career in college and in, in, in high school. But you know, I never did theater or stuff like that. And those are things that I wish I would have got into or had someone kind of encourage me to do so. And sometimes it's things like that, right. that, that get you to, right. to do it. Oh yeah. And if that had not happened there, I mean, there's no what, doubt in yeah. my mind, if that had not happened and, and someone had said to me, Oh, you know, you're, you know, school play or whatever. Oh, you, you're kind of good at that. You should go pursue that. I would have said what you don't fuck that. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm going to go play. Whatever, I'm a job. Yeah, I'm going to go play. Uh, you know, sports. Um, yeah. And so that forced me into it. That's and then, yeah. And when we were talking to some of your, uh, you know, producers earlier that, you know, I ended up going to Northwestern university in between junior and senior year. I think that's when it is. Uh, and, and you show up and it was sort of an intensive theater thing. And it was really at that moment, um, where I went, Oh no, this is what I want to do. Like this is, it's not just a hobby to keep me active because I screwed up my leg. This was like, oh no. And from there, I was just, I was, I was singularly driven to do what, what I do now. In high school, we had this thing, it's our senior year, we had, we had the, it was called the USO show, which is, you know, because back in the day, they would have the USO go and perform right. in the army. And so they, for social studies class, the, the senior class would put on their own show for the school and come up with like these skits and and we created the, uh, me and my friends created this dance and performed and, and the crowd shared and I remember being like this this was it was a very exhilarating feeling to have the audience respond and cheer sure and it's one of those things kind of like you said oh if you would oh my god please tell me there's a video of that I think somewhere. there is and, <laughs> and, and I would pay for it the Carlton dance is in there because I was really good at, I, I was really good at the Carlton dance oh, and like so Lord. yeah and it was we it, we did it to the song. Um, Oh, please tell me it was Vanilla Ice. No, it was like the Mamas and the... No, was it, was it the Mamas and the Papas? It was the, like, uh, the Age of Aquarius. Descend oh, the dawning oh of the... My uh, word. Uh, uh, oh. uh, yeah. No. It was, there is a videotape somewhere. I'm going to your wearing, sister And we're wearing wigs and stuff and, and, and everything. Oh, yeah. But the crowd loved it. And uh, it, was, uh, it was one of those things. I, I, I remember like feeling like I should have done a high school play. Oh, right. This was a lot of fun. Right, right. You right. know, but I just never I never did that. But that's that's so cool to, to think that cuz I'm I'm assuming when you were a kid going through that, you probably had some dark kind of like this especially when you found out your Achilles was like melting. Story worth. Well, it's Father's Day around the corner and get your dad a gift from the heart. That's right. Nothing is better than hearing your parents' stories of their childhood, their mischief. They got in trouble. They did some shit, right? And sometimes it's fun to hear all the mistakes your parents made and all the memories that they have. And they can do so with Story Worth. It's an online service that helps your dad, grandfather, father-in-law, and every father figure in your life share their stories through thought-provoking questions about their memories and personal experiences and thoughts. It's fun and a new way to engage with them, especially if you can't be together in person. Every week, Story Worth will email your dad or loved one a story prompt or a question about a favorite time in their life or a memory that they have. After one year, Story Worth will compile all your dad's stories, including photos, into a beautiful keepsake book that ships for free give your dad the most meaningful gift for father's day with story worth get started right away with no shipping required by going to storyworth.com slash v-i-a-l-l you'll get ten dollars off your first purchase that's storyworth.com slash v-i-a-l-l for ten dollars off think about all the quarantine purchases you made late night pizza the online trainer you ghosted after two weeks 
Then there's one of the biggest purchases of the year, insurance. I know we don't like to talk about it, but it's true. Americans overspend on car and home insurance by billions every year. Billions with a B. That's a lot of money. That's <laughs> money you could have spent on all the, you know, things like therapy or mental health or your shirt or, you know, something for your loved one. And that's where the zebra can help you. The zebra is the nation's leading insurance comparison site for a car and home insurance. In minutes, you can compare policies from every major provider for free. After a few quick questions, the Zebra pairs people with the right insurance company for them, helping everyone save time and money, buy online or over the phone with one of their licensed insurance agents. There are no hidden fees or fine print for your personal information. Best of all, the Zebra has no stake in the policy you choose. Make insurance your smartest purchase yet. Visit thezebra.com slash V-I-A-L-L for your free quote today. That's thezebra.com slash V-I-A-L-L. -L. As a new homer, I can tell you that the zebra helped me get the best home insurance for my house, and I saved a boatload. Yeah, no, it was it was it was it was not good. No, it was it was it was not good. And it and it was just the the rehab from all of that. You know, it at least in my memory and how it was sort of explained, and again, this was this was a surgery that I, I chose, I could have yeah, that's never, was, yeah. ever done it. It was something that I chose because sports w was so important to me. Um, and and my recollection was like, basically, you go in, you have the surgery, you do a little rehab, you come back, it heals a year later. And I think that like taking the stuff out is very simple. But uh, yeah, it turned into Do you ever, thing. since then, do you ever think about that kind of whole situation when when i'm sure you've had roadblocks in your adult life or like oh damn or that sucks or you made a bad decision do you always go back to that like let's just see like to help you get through you know when you're really upset about something or things don't work out do you think about that <laughs> no maybe i'm not that involved i don't know no because <laughs> i just I feel like the way do. you tell that story it's just like yeah listen i had this elective surgery my leg almost fell off I, i'm super into sports <laughs> turns out that's how I'm like a star. And I'm know. one of the like. If it weren't for that, this doesn't happen. I'm I, like, God, that would just be such a therapeutic thing in in every situation. Be like, it's fine. It'll work itself. It'll out. work itself out. No, I guess not. You know, and let me be clear. It this was like at the time you're just living life, mm -hmm. right? Like at the time, and when it was way more about like, oh, kind of like what you're saying, like, oh, doing these. Um, uh, high school plays or whatever like this is fun you know it was much more like that i it it's it's more it was more in retrospect well, that's what, that yeah, i realized adult, like, like I wouldn't have, yeah, yeah that yes like, yeah butterfly effect stuff like i exactly I, I have, and that's like, where it yeah. is for me yeah. yeah and i have you know thoughts of like all the things you know because like, i you know i was used to sell software and right. then i was you know my friend signed me up for a silly were you good show. at it yeah. yeah, I was. I liked it. What kind of software? Uh, I worked for a company called Salesforce. So we sold uh, oh, okay. CRM software. To Do you see how I've done this? I just turned it around yeah. on him. I'm going to ask him a question. <laughs> yeah, that's <Sam>. great. <laughs> um, and yeah, so it was uh, one of those things where you just, you, you, you're like, fuck it, I'll take a risk. And then I look back on all the things that happened or people I met. And, and it had nothing really to do with this specific thing I was doing, it was just like a random person I met or a situation that totally. made me meet someone else. And I real, I, you look back and you're like, wait, if that didn't happen, totally. So all these other things wouldn't have happened. And Sliding doors. Yes. Yeah. Is that a good movie? I've never seen it. You've never seen it. As in, is that a good movie? I, I reference it. it in my brain. No one's ever seen it. There's a great sandwich shop or a restaurant in San Francisco called The Sliding Door. The Sliding Door. Yeah, oh, do you know what? I, you don't even know what I'm talking about. The mo I've the, heard the no. movie. I've never seen it. You don't it. even know what I'm talking about? I sliding no Doors. It's kind about. of old. It's not like an old, old movie, but um, is it Gwyneth Paltrow? I don't know. It, it's, it basically is about, it's The Sliding Doors refers to the subway, right? And, and the idea is sort of the same. And I don't know if it's a good movie, but I think about that when, when someone starts talking like this, is that, is about to jump on the yes, subway. It is Gwyneth Paltrow, and the doors yep. close, and the I they it shows like what happens if 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 you make if you make it inside, yeah. and or what like what changes by not yeah. by think about staying on the outside. Yeah, a lot. Cause yeah. It's, uh, Wait, Brian, as a theater person, have you did you see If Then with Idina Menzel? 
because it's a musical like of the same concept like if she did one thing differently and then she goes through the whole show with two different lives no i haven't seen it's it. great yeah it's great yeah it's well i need to know if sliding doors is great but because <laughs> i reference it it's that idea. I don't. I just don't know if it's executed that well. I like the oh, actor, have it. and oh. I like the the concept. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. Uh, there. Maybe I'll yeah. Check we're, it out. We've 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 Googled it here in the studio, folks. <laughs> there you go. Sliding doors. It, that's the idea of it. Is basically what happens if you make it yeah. inside the subway at that moment, or you don't, and all the ramifications of that. I find Los Angeles because I hate saying Hollywood because I think that's really stupid, but. Los Angeles, <laughs> in a way, yeah, I guess I it's agree. a big city, but I feel like in some ways it it functions that way a lot. Like totally. it's a big city, but actually there, the connections between people and certain meetings or friendships you make through an unexpected, like after this, like who knew you and I, we were going to be besties. I'm, and now, my whole goal of this podcast no, I know. is to and now create best friends. We're going to be best friends. And then it's like, oh, you know Nick? That's weird. No, it's not. And then you know some. And then it just becomes, I don't know. It, I feel like the, this, this as large as Los Angeles is or the, the entertainment industry, I feel like it's small in a lot of ways. And, you, and oh, yeah. all those, those connections yeah. um, happen for random reasons. And, oh, if I hadn't gone here, I wouldn't have met and this wouldn't have happened. Blah, totally. Blah, blah. I think of LA as more of a place, not a city. Right. It's like a. It's more of an idea, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's not really a city. It's just like this weird sprawl of towns. And you're right. It can, it's super small. Yes. Uh, always be careful who you're rude to. Right. Um, yeah. Yes. But there also, then there's a lot of people who are just big talkers. I remember yeah. when I first moved here, everyone was like, I'm a producer and this. And I'm like, wow, what's a producer? <laughs> and like my other friend was like, yeah, they didn't, you know, they produced their Instagram, you know, whatever, or something like that. But um, so you were here for two months and then the office happened. Yeah. I'm sure you get this question a lot, but like what I, you were I, I, on your podcast, you were the, f no, that was Rain who said he was the first audition. I was just listening. To he was the again. first audition of, at the office. But yeah. like what, did you, you know, you had the English, British version of right. The Office. Right. And so when you were auditioning for it, there, there must have been some optimism around its success. You know, because either way, when they start a show, a pilot, I mean, who knows, right? Like, right, right, right. there's so many things, you know, so many pilots that happen that you never hear of and things like that. But did you have a lot of optimism when you were auditioning for the show of like, this could be something just be given its success over in, in, in Britain? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'll answer. I'll answer the question not in exactly the way that you, you asked it, but I, but I think to to kind of <laughs> tell the story, which is, I was a huge fan of the British version of the show, right? And so I'm here a couple months, and you know, I don't know if anyone who is listening or or watching or whatever like is is you know is interested in in being out here, but I feel like the thing that I did, and I think because I was from theater, and for me it was it was kind of about that was really about creating characters and the art of it. When I moved out here, it was very much about like learning the business. And that's what I did. And I took it like this is a business. Yeah, yeah. And and I, one of the things I did back in the dark ages of like not that long ago, I was I got a TiVo. I didn't have much money. I got a sure. TiVo. And I just started watching things because I was like, well, if I get an audition to go on this show and I've never seen this show, how yeah. can I know what the aesthetic is of this show? Or like um, the comedy or the style, or is it like noir -y? or is it super serious and straight? Or So I started doing that. I watched the British version. I loved it. I moved um, or I, um, I, I met a manager, an agent, and I you know, I'd started to work peripherally with some people. And I, I said, this is the show that I should be on because they're looking for unknown people. And I had an agent at the time, I've told the story many times, but to me it's just so perfect if you know agents at all. I went, called the agent and I was like, I, this is the show. Like they're looking for unknown people. I really get the comedy, I get the style, what they're looking for. And she said to me, well, they're looking for unknown people, but they're not looking for you unknown. Like totally <laughs> oh, unknown. 
like stra straight, yes, yeah, straight to me. And I, and now at the time I was like, what does that mean? At, now I totally get it. It's like known being famous, unknown being you've done. 17 yeah, they want kind to, of funny you've been on guest NCIS. spots yeah. you've been on <laughs> you've got yeah, your yeah. whole resume but like <laughs> you've yeah been killed on like 20 crime shows yeah you yeah you know, exactly or like you showed up as a delivery yeah. man in seinfeld like or like whatever into mcdonald's everyone would be like i know that guy but from where yes but exactly like, yeah. but my manager um worked and worked and worked and worked and got me a meeting with allison jones and um who was interested in different interesting people I mean I sort of got lucky they chose Allison Jones I got lucky that you know she agreed to see me and um and yeah and and so for for me it was all of that work came came to be to then ultimately just for them to feel like I fit into the ensemble in a certain way early on so so to answer your question I I was such a big fan of the British version that I was so excited. I was like, how could this fail? Without, and, and being so new here, not realizing, you know, in a, like, not, like, understanding intellectually it's hard to get a show and get on the air and have it run for a season and then two and then <laughs> 10 years. But I didn't really feel how, so I, I had this sort of. Ignorance is bliss kind uh, of yeah, thing. Yeah, kind of. Um, but once the show started and the ratings were bad, I mean, we, really thought we would be canceled after doing a very few number of episodes. And that is not, you know, it's n not trying to tell like a little engine that could story or something like that's just real. Sure. Like we did the pilot. It really almost never aired. And then they said, well, you can do five more. And so we did, we had a total of six and then we really were done. And, a bunch of stuff oh, happened. That's crazy to think about. M most namely, I like the Shit's Creek way. Yeah, but lot, I mean, but, Park and Rec got canceled yeah. and then came back. I mean, I guess that happens. But it's at, to your point when you look back at the, some of these successful shows and and just how successful The Office is now. People forget sometimes the early struggles right. or don't appreciate you know the challenges that that they had. It's interesting because I remember I remember when The Office premiered. Okay. I remember the previews and I remember like I'm going to love this. I I always liked it from the beginning. Now maybe it was cuz at the time it came out I was a cost accountant at a company called Besiris. And so when it came out I was like oh fuck. This that was very relatable. Like I really related to Jim's right. character and I remember after it came out I'd go in this other guy's office and then like so did that did that sting a little bit when watching that? We were talking about it just because it was just like the mundaneness of the office. And, and I was like, I always felt like as a cost accountant, cause I didn't really like it. It wasn't, I just, I decided to be an accounting major in college. It was my, you know, essentially my first job out of college. And it was just like, I don't know, I don't really do anything. I don't really add any value. <laughs> I do some spreadsheets, but like at the end of each day, it's just like, I don't feel like, you know, I could die and no one would really care, you know. Oh, God. <laughs> that's, that's how I so felt. That's terrible. Uh, yeah. But I remember it was such a, in that's a way, crazy. the office was like, it made me feel like there, there's, I got to do something else. Um, so I, I, I vividly remember watching the pilot episode and going to work the next day and like breaking it down with, with another buddy in the accounting department. Right. That's crazy. Um, and so, and, and, I just remember always, always liking it. Um, I, I never knew because I didn't check ratings or give right, a shit right. or pay attention to that stuff. But it's fascinating to think that it, it might not have, have, have made it. When did you realize that? When did it pop? So we, the first season was only six episodes, which again is crazy. Never done. That's like a burn off order. Like, well, all so right, we made these. Let's just air them. And, a bunch of things happen. We talk about this quite quite a bit on the podcast, but the most major thing was after the six episodes, and they're they're trying to decide if we're coming back for a season two. Um, a little movie called Forty Year Old Virgin came yeah. out, and and I think there were a lot of reasons that the show took off after that. But I think um, several people said that NBC at that moment couldn't let who was quickly becoming the biggest star yeah. in comedy film sure. go. It's yeah. like, we have that guy under so contract. Let's make this work. Let's see if we can try to do something. And then there were a lot of, of, of factors that sort of came up in the second season. And so first season airs, 
second season comes back uh, in September. There's a lot of, of, of reasons that it, it started to pick up. And uh, by December of that year, uh, culminating in the, the first Christmas episode that we did, it got 10 million viewers. And it was like, oh. And then just started rising from there. And so... They were picking up, they only picked up six to come back the, and then they were like, well, we'll do four more. It was something crazy, like, well, two like more. Never wanted to well, commit. we need some on, you know, February, so we'll do one more. I mean, it was literally the show was picked up like that, like, like eight different orders during one season. And I remember, um, uh, and then Steve wins a Golden Globe. And there are a lot, again, a lot of things that happened. And they finally said, okay, you can finish a full at the time 22 episodes of season two and within two weeks they had said and you're going to do a full season three which i think we ended up doing 28 to 30 season three so it was like from from like december to february of season two it became are we going to be back next week to like oh we're going to be sitting at these desks for a long time when do you feel like the the writers of the show or the show itself? Because I feel like the season one was very much trying to just recreate the British version, as you know, like a just like a remake, right? Right. But when did the show kind of become its own entity? And because they're like from a character development standpoint, you know, we slowly got to know Kevin and Michael and and and. And Dwight and all you know, and and really build, and then it really kind of just became its own thing. Where do you feel like that that happened? I think there were two shifts. Um, I mean, I I don't disagree with 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 what you're saying. The the kind of the premise of your question. I think that, but there, I think there are two answers. I think what's crazy is the second episode that we ever did after the pilot was this episode called Diversity Day, and for some people. It's like, it, it, you know, uh, Greg Daniels and I on the podcast were talking about it. Like, it was our second episode. Was it maybe, maybe our best? Like, so they're, they're early on after the pilot, we started doing some episodes that were truly transformative in terms of what you were allowed to or what shows were talking about on network television in terms of race, you know, eventually in terms of homosexuality, uh, gender disparity, all, all of those things. Um, so I think in a lot of ways, very early, it became our own. But I think to your point, there were two things. Starting in season two, there was a conscious decision. Again, the show is struggling. There was a conscious decision between the producers and NBC um, to basically shoot ex an episode exactly the same way that we would season one. Michael is terrible, sexual harassment uh, episode is a good example, but like, you know, can say horrible things, totally cringy, but they wanted every episode to have just a little bit of an uptick, a little upswing, like they called moment, it, yeah. just a little something. So uh, manifesting itself in, in moments like, oh, oh, you know, he may not be the best boss, but he's actually good at his job. Like yeah. he can sell, oh, the Halloween episode, like he has this horrible encounter at work and then you see him afterward with kids giving candy out and you're like, oh, like this is a guy who like has more to him yeah. that is not just totally terrible. And and so that was a conscious shift. And then- That was brilliant to you think about it. Oh, it, 100%. It really makes you, yeah, because after a while, sometimes you'll watch shows and, and shows I like, and you're just like, I don't like anyone, you know? Right. You're just like, right. these are all kind of terrible people. Right. You know? Well, and, and I, Yes. And then when with so, so, Michael and so many characters in The Office, you're, you're right. Just, I love that idea that Michael might be, might be a bad boss. He might be ignorant, and he might be, you know, so, socially inept. But, like, he, the people love him. He's good at his there, job. Yeah. He's, like, kind of un not replaceable and it's like this it's this almost easter egg of of it, it good qualities yes and i love the arc there you bring up something that is really important and is beneath the surface it's not on the exterior right because some people are like 
it's so cringy. I can't watch it. He's so terrible or, you know, their relationship is so terrible or like cringeworthy. And, but at the, at its fundamental base, if you look at the show, there's a lot of love. Oh yeah. There's a lot of kindness. There's a lot of, uh, having each other's back. I mean, there is sort of a, a oddly because of the exterior sort of a fundamental goodness and sweetness and heart. It just doesn't show itself as obviously sure, as some yeah. other shows well, even like do. the accounting department, right? You know, you Oscar, Angela, Kevin, you and Kevin, it's like, they have this, like, they're all very different. They all make fun of each other, but they're also a team, right? You know, and you always see that. And I think that's why people endear, themselves to the show or why it's so likable because at the end of the day they want to help each other out and they tease each other right and, and that really does work right do you to that point you know a lot of people especially nowadays they'll look back on shows like the office and say i don't know if we could make the office today in 2021 right. because of some of the things that are talked about some of the jokes and sometimes i want is that true because what the office did it wasn't they threw a very comedic way kind of pull, uh, called out some of this behavior, the, whether it's racism or sexism or sexual harassment, they show like n you never watched it. And all the character, like the, you know, like Michael would always get called out by his, his employees, whether it's a through an eye roll or something to be Nick, like, you you're can't say that. What are you doing? Are you reading everything that I've ever said? What you're saying is this is exactly right. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but when you're right, you're right. No, this is the thing that's so, so confusing to me. Um, you, you have someone say something inappropriate. I'll give maybe my favorite example from the show. And now I'll probably be canceled for saying this joke. But Michael very earnestly sits down and turns his chair around and leans into Oscar and says, Oscar, um, what's, a, what's a term that's less offensive than Mexican? And Oscar's like, there's nothing offensive about Mexican. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what can I call you that's less <laughs> offensive than Mexican? And he... He has he says this thing. Now you can't say that. That's a totally horrible, yeah. inappropriate thing to say. But and even you when you're saying it, I'm awkwardly like it's like yes, an awkward laugh. Yes, you're uncomfortable, but you know. You have sixteen people in the room that are holding their head, rolling their eyes, mouths agape, looking at the camera. So what you have are sixteen people telling you as the audience. This is an inappropriate yes, thing to say. Not okay. This is not something that you can say. This is a misguided statement. Um, this is a guy who is attempting to be PC, but is getting it all totally wrong. And so now to go back and say, you can't say that joke, it makes no sense to me. Because how do you get to the end result if... The joke isn't made. You I, can't. You, you you have to say what the joke is, um, in order to have that response against it. And so I think, I think yes, but I think the show would be different. I actually think that, as a, I think that in addition potentially, to Michael Scott being um, uh, called out for being inappropriate in that way. My guess is that Michael would attempt to be way too woke. Yeah. And there would be some poking at it actually from the other side. I would love to see an side. office episode on cancel culture. There, exactly. Right? Exactly. And how you guys, I mean, I think the office would do, I, I, I'm with you. I disagree with, I think the office would thrive in this climate, right? Because right. we have such a hard time sometimes talking about these things. Things are divisive and, and sometimes through comedy, there are, is always that kind of common ground. And just the way the office did that was introduce this kind of inappropriateness, this awkwardness, this ism, whatever the ism was. Right. And, and through comedy would teach you, you know, what's right or what's wrong, you know, because so many people out there aren't, are the Michael, like we're all Michael Scott to a certain degree. We've all been, we've all lacked self-awareness in, in whatever moment. And totally. sometimes we don't realize it until like we realize people are looking at us like, what the fuck did I do? <laughs> right. Um, and so it, it, 
we just that it allows people to have these discussions sometimes to totally. get the different points of view. Totally. Yeah. So also it kind of speaks to like, I, I didn't even realize this, but uh, after listening to your, uh, listening to your podcast, how the office is being digested and consumed now, it's, it's bigger than ever with how it's, how many streams is billions in the yeah. past couple of years. Yeah. I mean that, that, that was really why we decided to do it now. I mean, we were for after the struggle period, right? But for most of the time that we were on NBC, we were the number one scripted show on NBC. So we were big, like it was, we were the hit. We were the hit of the network. And that's why we were doing like, you know, no one does any more than 22 episodes. And we were doing 30 at times because they were like, give, give us this, we need your numbers. Like bring in, we'll do a whole Thursday night, do an hour, like do as much as you can. I mean, so much so that the writers and producers were like, we can't, we can't produce as much television. Yeah. Like we want to keep it good. Um, but yeah, what happened was when the show ended, and streaming really started. I mean, it was it was on when we were on, but you know, in the Netflix, the explosion of Netflix and watching things, binge watching, that the show, based on any metric you can look at now, is the most watched show in television today, and including new shows, mm -hmm. all the hit, uh, you know, hip, cool new shows that are out. It's the most watched show. And the reality is, is like, it isn't close. Like the disparity between where the office and, and like how many minutes are being consumed between number one and two is like, is almost double. So yeah, I think the, the big stat was the first day that was considered um, the pandemic, right? Of, of 2020, so it was like March 18th or something like that, it was a Sunday. Um, it set a record. It was something, something like, and it don't, but it was like two hundred and fifty nine million minutes consumed in one day, and that was streaming alone. So if somebody had a DVD or was watching on Comedy Central, sure. like that's not even counted. It is just, it was crazy. You know, like broke a record for all time and for it, and and yeah, it's like billions and billions and billions of minutes streamed over the last several years, and. Um, and that's really why I started the podcast was to look at why, what has happened, why it was a hit. Now, why is it, you know, the huge hits of like the time were like friends or Seinfeld or, you know, that was, and now why is it like, why have we taken this turn and, and gone so crazy? And, and that's really why we started the podcast was to try to fit for me, just as a curiosity, yeah, it, why it is kind of fascinating. My, one of those people was my old neighbor. She, they lived below me and before I bought my house and the, the, the walls were thin and it, she watched it 24 <laughs> seven. She kind of sucked, but other than that, she had good, <laughs> good taste in television, but, but it's yeah. access, right? What do you yeah. mean? It's access. That's what makes it great because now you have all these services that make you accessible to these shows that right. you weren't able to have access to before. Yeah. But the show what were you itself. doing before, like recording it on your VCR. Right. Right. Like, <laughs> You know, no, but also, but why are they choosing that yeah. as opposed to the hundreds of thousands why, of other shows that they could be so watching? So many on years that? later, why and is so it many still years later. like enjoyable and why is it still hitting the mark for a lot of people? Yeah. Also, like, there, I think there's so many nuances in the show. It's one of those shows that you can keep watching uh, and, and get new laughs out of it. Right. You know, you appreciate new things that you don't don't remember happening, right. and and just kind of the character development, I think, also plays a, a big role. Yeah, for sure. How, how do you did? How much input did did cast have? Because I feel like, and and I haven't watched it. Um, and I mean, I watched the pilot last last night, but I haven't watched it in a, in a, like closely for like in a year or so. But I I, I kind of remember, like, as the characters, like even like getting to know you or meeting you. Like I could see Kevin, obviously it's not you, but like there are also moments of like, you know, casino night where all of a sudden Kevin's this like very competent, like gambler or when Kevin, the musician, like how, how much of that 
was the writers going to you guys and being like, well, like, what are you good at? What do you like? How can we show a little bit more of you? Because it seemed like once yeah. in a while we'd be surprised by, you know, Dwight or Kevin and the humanity that they would have. Right. Well, I think that, um, okay. Oh God. I mean, we're, this is, we're going deep now. Do you want to go deep? <laughs> we're going to go. We'll go deep. You had, you drove up from so, San Diego. I so you, you, if you have, okay, intellectually, you think I want more people to. I want as many people as possible to relate to something. So you draw a character in broad strokes, right? You make a character very general, and I think what the office did, and one of the reasons that people are still watching it or consuming it more is that <clears throat> what what I think is that the opposite is true which is that the specificity and dichotomy that exist within the characters is actually more true and makes it more universal so I'll give you an example on a typical television show I would say a the character of Kevin he eats a lot be very messy totally incompetent in any way possible. Like, right, you can start to see how that character plays out in a typical television yeah. show. But that's yeah. not but that's not real, right? Mm -hmm. So Kevin actually um we would have debates depending on what we were doing about m my sport coat. And I would say Kevin always wears a sport coat. He always wears a sport coat. His tie is a little short, but it's always done up and he always has a sport coat on. And he may have purchased his ensemble for thirty nine ninety nine at wherever, but he's going like he is presenting himself yeah. in a certain way. He and cares. He he cares. And you know, by the way, Michael doesn't think he's good at basketball, but he actually he he actually has a hoop in his driveway, and and he can shoot the rock right. He um he the the, the biggest meta meta joke. I'll share it with you because it is hilarious, also no one would ever get it on The Office, is that Kevin Malone is the lead singer, drummer, of a police cover band. Okay, <laughs> stay with me. Police, there, I don't quite understand the syncopation, I don't know, the beat, the singer in Police sings off of the beat of the drum, okay? So the reason that Kevin Malone is the lead singer, this is true, uh, and drummer of a police cover band is that it would take a musical savant to be able to sing police while playing the drums. Yeah. It's almost <laughs> impossible, right? But that was their joke. Their joke was like, no, no, he actually, he excels yeah. at this. It's a joke, yeah. he doesn't sing well, he blah, 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 but no. And so they were constantly trying to find these dichotomies within the characters, within all of the characters, um, that just gave it that complexity. I think the biggest example, um, and maybe one of the greatest characters created of all time is Dwight Schrute, right? So like you, you say Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> nerd, right? Yeah. But then you go, who loves heavy metal, drives a Trans Am, wants to be a sheriff's deputy. Like there are this authoritative, weird, with Dungeons and Dragons and paintball, but heavy metal. This is a character that that is is not drawn a certain way, you know, nerd. Like everyone's seen those characters on television. But yet all of those complexities together, that specificity that the writers had with all of that, um, I think ultimately makes them all more relatable yeah. and universal. And it's the opposite of what your brain tells you to do. It's located in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And here are real places that exist there that these real people go to. And as opposed to, oh, we're in the Midwest and, you know, there's a, Starbucks or you know whatever like like painting it generally or even like there's a coffee shop called Coffee Olay but that coffee shop doesn't exist but no this bar in Scranton this exists this pizza place it exists and this is where they would go if they were in offices and I think all of those things um, contribute now the, the, the people buy it because it's true 
Yeah, and I think you know you have the office. You have these kind of exaggerated personalities of these characters. But to to your point, it's relatable because if you've ever worked in an office, like it has a bunch of different personalities. Everyone's weird to their own right. You know, in their own way, and and yet they are functioning, even successful people in various things. Kind of going back to your original point, and you think about. You know, like those charming moments where Dwight would just be this kind of crazy, you know, into all these things and, you know, rude or whatever, or heavy metal in his car. And then him and Jim would clash and then they get into a sales call together and they're the dynamic. They're Batman and Robin, you know, and it's like or Phyllis with her her like makeup and she just knows and it just works. And as someone who's in sales, like I you I loved kind of watching you know, it was just it, figure it out how whatever it takes, and and that was always very relatable and fun, and how people were able to use their kind of weirdness as their own strength, right, is always kind of fascinating. Maybe that's what makes it work. Is in terms of I think we all relate to being weird, and, right, and judged, right, and 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 and, uh, and we don't want people to find out that we're just kind of fucking weirdos. <laughs> um, and, and the office really kind of makes makes it feel like it's okay. Um, and, and still have friends and, and be made fun of and tease each other, but have, you know, I, that, I think that's what's so great about The Office in terms of, like you said, they're always bickering, they're always rolling their eyes, they're always making fun of each other, but there's, it's, it's a family, like a family would, right? You, you're like, right. You're, I have to love you, so you're my brother and sister, but there's a loyalty there and that, that it makes it so kind of fun and, and charming. Yeah. Um, and, and I love that about about the show who, who is give, wait, I'll, 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 just about that because i'll give you one specific example you, you just brought it up again and, and sort of said it before um in terms of the shift between season one and season two this is like a perfect example which is in terms of that little upswing right so michael scott is terrible he's hosting the dundies he's in terrible he's embarrassing they roll their mm-hmm. eyes he gives Phyllis the bushiest beaver award. <laughs> he gives me the don't go in there after me award He for the bathroom. He, all of these terrible, embarrassing, like, God, terrible boss. And what happens is in that episode, there's some guys in the bar that start heckling him. And they say, you suck. They start literally like being rude and mm-hmm. nasty to him. And Pam... It, the the feeling is you no know, we can make fun of him yeah we can roll our eyes but you yeah. you can't and she stands up for him and ultimately has that and so i think that's one example but to what you're talking about that that the family that was created the dysfunctional family that happened to be in an office exist and that's sort of that theme of love and stuff that's like an example so like hey uncle you know, crazy uncle Larry, like the family could shit on crazy uncle Larry. But like, if the neighbor starts yeah. talking shit about crazy exactly. uncle, Larry, no, 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 that's Larry. That's Larry. He's got issues, but we love him. You yeah, know, it's that the loyalty, that, there. that thing. Yeah. Who is your favorite character? My favorite character, Kevin, Kevin Malone. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, I, I think, I mean, my answer would be Kevin Malone, but I think Dwight, the character of Dwight Schrute, um, one, what Rain brought to it, but just that, that you can go so crazy and so big, but if you keep it specific and can make it real and can, because if... His earnesty, yeah. Yeah, yeah and you go, you go like, people say all the time, like, oh, I know a Dwight. And you know, like the in terms of the characters, like oh, everybody knows a Phyllis or a Creed or a Kevin. And you look at Dwight and you're like, really? Do you really know a Dwight? Because I don't think a Dwight really exists. Like that has all of those dichotomies, but there's a there is a an internal sort of need from him or whatever, or some of the stuff that's on the surface that exists with people that becomes universal. I think he's a genius character. Yeah. Yeah. Then there's so many good ones. You know, it's one of those things you can name one and go, oh, what about right. Oscar? You know, uh, tw- I mean, Creed, is, I've always had a soft spot for Creed. You're one of those, huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I mean, also, after listening to your <laughs> podcast, the pre- it was just the, one of my favorite lines of the whole series was when he's talking about cults. It's like, and he's just like, 
I've been in a cult both as a leader and a follower. It's more fun as a follower, but you make more money as a leader. Like it's, <laughs> ah, it's so good. Yeah. Uh, but it's 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 such a such a great great show. Um, I I love you mentioned on on your show uh, how proud you are of the final season of The Office. You know, with Mike uh, with um, Michael, um, well Michael not being there, but I, and I really like that just because the show. When when he left the show, when Steve left the show, um, I think everyone, even fans, were like, "Oh, I'm done!" And how could you? I mean, he's the he was the star of the show, and and yet it was it still was great. It's still and it has its own feel to it, and yeah. and it was also nice to see more Kevin, more Dwight, you know, you know, more of the characters that um, didn't you know, get as many lines and, um, it was a huge success and, and it's really, I, I, it's, I, I, something you should be proud of. And it's really cool to, uh, to watch that. Um, was that the most fun you had w making it or was that being proud of it after the fact kind of, um, did you think it, how, how worried were you after Steve left? I was really worried with after Steve, after Steve left. And I mean, so like the, the general progression was, should we be done? And everybody feeling like, mm, no, I think I think we've got some more that we could do. And so what? So he left. Um, there were four episodes left in season seven when he left. We brought in Will Will Ferrell um, for those last four, which were really about buffering him leaving and us having the time to begin to introduce how the show would be once he was gone, but not just starting a new season with that. Um, and so he, he, season eight, I feel like we, um, we were all trying to figure out where, where we were. Uh, James Spader came in to lead the office and we were all kind of trying, it, the, the structure of the show wasn't as simple. Like boss, like Spader was CEO, but he was there, and it was Andy, and, mm -hmm. and so it just it all sort of started to change, and as you say, sort of expand out a lot more stories with other characters. Um, but I think that the last season, season nine, we had the rare opportunity that played out over a season, which was Greg Daniels knew how he wanted to end the show; he'd known how he wanted to end the show from the beginning essentially, which was for this documentary that they had been shooting for nine years to air. Mm -hmm. And what he felt like was he could, he always wanted to do that, but he couldn't do it. And I think, you know, re, really the reason is if you look at reality television, is that once people see themselves on TV, the behavior changes. It has to. Mm -hmm. There's no. There's. There's nothing else to do. You've now seen how a producer is portraying you. You are now seeing how situations are playing out, how things are cut or edited. And you know, we go into that a little bit in the later episodes when they start to see it themselves. Like, you know, Dwight and Angela had an affair that they didn't think anybody <laughs> saw the whole time, and they were being filmed by the crew. You know, things like that. Um, and so. He felt like once that aired, then the show was done. And so sort of the build up to that of the last season and then what happened sort of to the characters in the aftermath of that, I I was tremendously proud of, of that storyline. And I think that us coming back um, for the end is uh, is really special. Yeah. It was really cool. It was a great, great finale too. Uh, last, last comment on the office, but uh, one one of the best teachable moments I ever had from being on reality TV was from the office. It was the episode where, um, like the they were announcing the documentary and it was coming out, and then Andy got all excited and he was like looking at reviews of himself and then responding to the critics and only to find out it was like a coworker of his just trolling him. And it was just more like you just never know who it is and who they are. So just don't give it much credence and credit because you know, you're going to, 
it, it doesn't really matter. You know, right. someone, whether they know you or not, they might just be trying to elicit a response. Oh, and yeah. I remember watching that and just being like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, was a, a good lesson. I remember, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think it was airing when I was on the show, but I, I, re I remember seeing that episode after being first on reality TV and experiencing the internet. And, uh, it was a really helpful moment for me. Yeah. So that's it's cool. Kind of crazy, crazy how like in real life you can, you know, kind of going back to our, you know, the cancel culture of it all. And, and it's funny, it's entertaining. It's great to watch, but you can learn a lot from, <laughs> right. from the show about <laughs> right. yourself. And it's the, again, through comedy, the humility of this, like the vulnerability of being like, you know, that, yeah, I've done that. That was me. Yeah. You know, I've been that guy, you right. know, and, uh, it yeah. makes you feel good that you can watch someone like Andy Bernard That's right. doing it and be like, well, you know, it's okay then. Right. You know, uh, I wanted to shift a little bit just because I have you here. You're, I know you're a big sports fan. Yes. Um, and, uh, well, who, who do you root for in sports? Um, well, I, I, I'm a little bit weird and, and in multiple ways about who I root for. I mean, the, the first answer is, is that, as I mentioned extensively, I was a big baseball guy mm -hmm. and I grew up in Atlanta and I was a huge fan of the Atlanta Braves yeah. and based on my age. So I was, I was really leaving Atlanta when they started getting good. Okay. Um, so this is like the nineties and Greg Maddox and John Smoltz and, um, I was a big fan of them too. And, then. and Tom Glavin. Yeah. yeah. And so I, and the turn TBS had the Braves. So as I was going and doing, uh, you know, theater places, I could watch the Braves on TBS, you know, and then, you, and then it sort of shifted and I could watch like two thirds of the games or half the games, or whatever. But I stuck with them. And that was who that was my team. A hundred percent. And then I moved to Southern California. And I decided, or I realized very, very quickly, I am never leaving. <laughs> I am, I am never going back to Atlanta. I'm never going. I'm never, you know, my vagabond life is over, and this is where I live now. And I was such a huge fan of baseball. I it was truly, it was like a conscious decision, which was, I could go back and watch a game a year maybe in Atlanta visiting family or I could buy Dodger season tickets and jump all in and that was one of the first things I did. Now my tickets moved down in the stadium as the years <laughs> went on, but I had upper deck tickets, uh, season ticket stadium. package yeah. um, when I first moved and so that so I root for the Dodgers and I love the Dodgers and the Lakers. And I always really liked the Lakers back when it was um, Boston and the Lakers. Uh, so that was really easy for me. But I, you mentioned I'm a big sports guy and I, I started to meet people because there are a lot of athletes that are uh, fans of the office. And um, I kind of play on this, oh, this is so lame to even call it this, but like, this sort of celebrity golf circuit, sure, which is 90% yeah. made up of athletes and like 10% other entertainers. Um, and so I started to become friends with guys who were either current players who were playing or like Hall of Fame players who had kids that were fans of the yeah. show and all sort of Jerry in relation and, yeah. To, to, yeah, to Jerry Rice and, and MJ. And, you know, like, so there was just this whole... I, and I and I bought in. I love that. I lo and as a sports fan, for me to play golf w with yeah. these guys, like for me, it's like a, an amazing dream. And so my current sports teams. Anyway, the whole point is, is that a lot of it now and my allegiances really are about the guys that I have You're relationships friends, with. Yeah. I'm yeah, and that's You're what I always say, which is like, do I root for this like? weird hometown I used to and you know I I from Atlanta I root for the Falcons I like the Falcons I Matt Ryan is a fantastic guy or whatever um it, it, truly and um but yeah so I sort of have these weird teams that I root for because I have friends that 
that I've gotten to know, and I root for my r- real friends and and not the sort of innocuous thing. Aaron Rodgers. Is so a I'm a Green Bay Packers fan. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm a I, I'm a diehard Packers fan. Packers fan. I'm a die from I, Wisconsin. Yes, yeah. 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 I'm a big Aaron Rodgers fan. Okay. I, I, Good. I, you're a friend, so I don't. I, I, how do you feel about the situation that's going on? Um. Well, I feel like it is. <sighs> The situation is just is so obvious to me. I, I mean, I, it's hard to even say. Like, you go to the NFC Championship game in 2019. By the way, if you're not a sports fan, you might as well tune out for the next five minutes or hit the skip ahead button. They go to the NFC Championship game in 2019, and they play San Francisco, and they clearly don't have the players. Mm-hmm. They needed some more horses. And they needed maybe someone who could catch the ball. Definitely some people who could defend the ball a little bit better. But they were in a good spot. And then the draft comes and you not just do you not take one of those type players, but you draft a quarterback, which is not a position of need. And I don't think on the team. And you trade up and give away other assets to do that and you don't have a conversation with your MVP to explain to him why you're deciding as an organization to do that when the MVP has said that I want to retire a Packer. So the fact that there is weirdness going on now is should not surprise anyone. I don't I don't I don't know why it would because you know the fact of the matter is is that since that time the organization has made a number of decisions all of them all of them triggering and indicating that we didn't make a mistake what we did the year before by drafting a quarterback and trading up in the draft to do that all the decisions being made are essentially endorsing the fact that your MVP and now league MVP uh, who uh, took you to the second straight NFC championship game, you've triggered that we're going to at some point have to go with our, our new guy. So I don't, I don't see that. I don't see why anyone would be confused that we're in this mess. Yeah. I, I, I get, I, I always try. Cause I, when, as a Packer fan, right? Like, I'm both, but I, my allegiances have always been with the team. They were a team. They were they were with the team when Favre was the quarterback, right. and, and Rodgers came in, and so I I was just like, all right, well, Aaron Rodgers is our guy, and so now it's like I love Aaron Rodgers. I'm so appreciative of as a fan. You're just like, oh, thank you. Well, wait, let me ask you this, then, as a fan, do you you think they made the right decision to draft Jordan Love? To 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 do three things: to draft Jordan Love, to trade up. And give away other assets to draft Jordan Love and to not speak to your MVP about drafting a person that's a quarterback. Okay, I have, some, I have thoughts on all this. Okay. When they drafted Jordan Love, I was pissed Okay. at first. I was just right. like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, I wanted right. a receiver, you know? Right. As soon as they drafted Jordan Love, I was just more like, okay, well, like, quarterback, the most important position. You know, as a Packer fan, you are one of the few – fan bases who have seen the benefit of drafting quarterback when you don't need one having them sit around so like like 20 years you know 16 years ago you're just like well well that really worked out you know so like right. maybe this will happen again you're like okay and you're just like you know we've we've been trained to trust the front office and that that uh, is focused on winning now and in the future so after the when they first drafted i was pissed and then i was just like i don't know well Whatever. Let's hopefully he's good. We'll see. Hopefully we don't have to see for several years, right? right. Uh, I didn't. So I the trading up hated that. Right. You know, I was like, why? Why didn't we just see if we could get him then? But then I kind of talked myself into being like, well, if you really believed in the guy, go get your guy, right. kind of thing. Uh, as far as not talking to Aaron, I blame Mark Murphy. Uh, because he was the one who was like, I'm the, I'm the politician. I'm the front office guy. I'm the one who's going to be in charge of relationships. So I definitely think they dropped the ball, but I, I think it's the president who said I'm in charge of all of these people. 
So I blame Mark, and I, you know, every in the press, it's all about Gudikins and the GM, and I'm just like, how is Mark Murphy not responsible for this? I, I think he should have been in charge of massaging these relationships. If I'm just putting myself in Aaron's shoes, I totally understand why he'd be frustrated. If I, as someone who like, you know, we work with, I don't product, know if he's frustrated yeah, by the yeah, way. Yeah, I'm I, not putting I, reports. I, yeah, if I, if the reports are true. I, I could understand. I you know I have a relationship with this, with this production company, and as a talent, I'm I'm always being like, what the fuck, kind of like whatever. And there's a balancing act. And I I if I if I'm Aaron, I would want to control my destiny. But it's just as a fan, I'm I'm struggling. Sometimes I've been mad at Aaron. I've been mad at the Packers through this whole process. Ultimately, I just want him back, and I want them to win, and I want him to win more Super Bowls than Tom Brady. Um, but it's um, I, you know, I, I, I just, I, you know, as a fan, you just want your players to play and not care about anything else other than winning, and it's, it's a challenge. Packer fans are, are mixed because right. we've been trained to trust the organization. Right. Yeah, and I think uh, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I just, I think that, I think that's another just. Um, I think comparing it to the Favre situation of 16 years ago is is not right. Really? Yeah. Would- well, because <clears throat> they have been to back-to-back NFC Championship games. Yeah. And clearly their team right now is in a completely different place. They went to the NFC Championship game in Favre's last year with the Packers. And he threw an overtime interception to lose the game. No, no, no. When they when they dra- when they drafted. Oh, when they drafted. When yes. they drafted. The Packers weren't very good. No. Yeah. When they drafted. You're right. That's true. So if the the point is, you want to win championships, right? Do you want to win championships, or do you want to be pretty good for a long period of time? Like that. That to me is the question, and I think I everybody want to wants to win champ- yeah. championships, right? And so if you if you are there, which is where they were, and to me that is the single. That, that's true. Big, big, biggest difference. Favre wasn't playing well when they drafted Aaron Rodgers. Right. And, and Aaron Rodgers. When they were what? Six and MVP. 10 or, yeah. you know, whatever. I mean, it was a totally, totally different situation. And and their position of need right now was very specific. Everybody knew it. And, um, and they choose, chose to do something else. Not knowing how he feels, do you think he'll be the quarterback of the Green Bay Packers? I have no idea. You have no idea. Okay. Right. I, <laughs> I really, I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> Help me out. <laughs> um, all right, Kevin. Uh, Kevin. Oh, it happened. Oh, my goodness. It happened. I can't believe you I just mean, it only took an that. hour and a half. Oh, uh, Brian. Yeah. No, it's all right. Does that happen a lot? Oh, it, ha- I mean, it happens all the time. It, it happens, and it happens to people that I know. Like, okay, I feel better. No, I mean now. we're we're I now besties. I died inside. We're I'm so embarrassed for we're, you. We're now <laughs> we're now besties. But we weren't. We're about to play a com- game called Do You Know Me? I'm getting getting your <laughs> god, goddamn name right. Um Oh god. Yes. I no no no, it happens all. No, it happens all the time. I mean, I'll be you know, I play a lot of golf and I play golf with guys and some guys I know really really well and some guys I, you know, I play with occasionally and I'll be, you know, guys and we'll talk or whatever and then I'll hit a really great shot on hole four and just hear good shot Kev <laughs> also because Kev is like a great like Nick uh, good shot short. Kevin Kev Kev and and for, and for me it's always Cry. like it's always like do you do I do I correct them because as soon as they realize it they're gonna have the same response that you oh, just mid-sentence did. I was like <laughs> <laughs> no it's totally uh. fine all right, Brian, are you down to play a game that we play with our guest called Do You Know Me? I don't know, but let's try it. All right, let's try it. It's real right. simple. Fine. I'll uh, ask a question. Does Brian this? Has Brian ever done that? You will not answer it away. We're going to guess the answer. Oh, you're going to guess the answers. Okay. Uh, if you have an anecdotal story, story, please share it. You don't have to. Okay. Do You Know Me with Brian Baumgartner. Question number one. Has Brian ever crowd surfed? Oh, crowd surfed. Like at a concert. I was like, I don't even know what that is. Has Brian ever crowd surfed? I know what crowd surfing is. Uh, no. No. He was in a wheelchair, and then he had, like, his broken leg. Most and then he, like, people moved haven't. on to, like, the arts. And then, like, I'm, I'm guessing no. Hell yeah. I think he has. I think he has. 
No. All right. I'm going to go with no. No. Yeah, no, I've never crowd surfed. No. <laughs> I <laughs> wouldn't. Like, I don't trust people I, enough. I, I, crowd, yeah, no, I've not crowd surfed. I apologize. I feel like, I, so I, there's no anecdotal story. If I haven't done it, no. yeah. I can't so even. So then we just move on. Yeah, that's okay. I do like a good crowd. And I will tell you that um, if you listen to the the Creed Bratton interview, you will know the story. He did a lot, back before the pandemic when other bad things were happening in the world, um, there were wildfires in Australia. I don't know if you guys even yeah. remember yeah. this. That was, that was right before the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Right before the pandemic and Creed Bratton was supposed to be doing a series of shows. I'm interrupting your game. No. But a series of shows across Australia got canceled. He decided to hold a benefit for the people of Australia for the thing. We do a concert. This is like a week before the world shuts down. I mean, like at the most two, at the Roxy, Sunset Boulevard, there were more people jammed into that place than maybe ever. I mean, it was yeah. it was one of those things where you walk in and it's just hot air, Ugh. people, breath. The Roxy gets sweat. like that a lot though. Yes. It's like par for the course. And I was like, after of course, when it happened like two weeks later, I was like, this was the super spreader event to end all super spreader events. <laughs> Yet we didn't. All right, go ahead. That's but okay. I did not crowd surf. I thought about it that night. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Does Brian believe in any conspiracy theories? Any, meaning like anything from aliens I don't, to government. But to like, like he has to like, not like, oh yeah, maybe, but like a true believer in at least one, like we could do a whole like podcast on a 51. conspiracy theory if he believed. <sighs> See him area 51-ing it maybe. I, I, I'm going to say no. I think you'd probably be like me where it's just like, I'm sure there's things out there that we think to be true that are not. But uh, isn't like there's no one specific conspiracy theory that you will, you know, want to do a podcast about. Yeah, die by. I feel like he enjoys reading about them, but yeah, there's not like one that he would stake a claim. I don't know. I'm I think, hope there's one. I think you. I think there's at least one that you really would go for. She doesn't know me at all. She's like over two. This is <laughs> terrible. You're over two. Everyone else is right. I guess I'm transparent. No, I. I really. I really don't. I. I. I think kind of like what you said. I can't remember what you said. You want to like to I, read oh, them? You read enjoy about, reading oh, them? Yeah. Oh no, I guess that's not exactly true. I. I know. I. Th- what I think is, which to me is just logic. I don't know. That the 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 number of people that would have to keep this secret in order to make it a conspiracy is that is not that is not possible in human nature. I agree with, you, especially with the internet these days. This is well, yeah. Uh, question number three: Can Brian name all five Spice Girls? Like their their names or their nicknames? Like no, I, the no, I say not, no. Not I bet he could do three. I bet he can do three. Mm. I believe in you. I think you can. It'd be like a Kevin moment where you say no and all of a sudden I, he just I drops can, them all. I'm going to go with three. You can name three. I like yeah. that. I think you could do three. No. <laughs> no, I can't do them. I can't you do can't them. Do, you can't I, do I, any I can, Spice no, Girls. I could do three. I, I'm, I'm panicking a little bit. And see, now the next question, I'm not going to look in his eyes because I'm sure when he asked that question, he was looking at me and so quickly said, I was like, oh, he totally saw in my eyes that I can't do it. That's kind of... Uh, I was like, <laughs> the Spice Girls... Well, you know, there's... I mean, that's the problem is like there's, uh, you know, Beckham. Um, Posh Spice. Posh, Posh Spice, yeah, obviously. What's the little one? Scary Spice. Scary Spice, yeah. Ginger Spice. Ginger Spice. Baby, uh-huh. Baby, Baby Spice. Baby Spice. Sporty 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 Spice. <laughs> Gremlin Spice. Yeah, all of them. Gremlin Spice. <laughs> I did panic. I did panic. I, 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 sh- I could have gotten those. Right, here's a chance to redeem yourself. Okay. Does Brian know who Billy Ellish is? Or Eilish? I don't. Does Nick know who? <laughs> Does Nick know who Billy Eilish, Eilish is? <laughs> I I read it. I I don't know how to read. Oh, well, it's one of the best concerts I've ever been to. Sorry, I gave it away. <laughs> Do you know who Billy Eilish is? I'm not looking at you because I think you would know in my eyes. That's why uh, I'm covering uh, yes, my eyes. Yes, he, she's, yes, yes, yes. Let's say yes. She's everywhere. Yes. Yeah, I'll say yeah. Brian doesn't look yeah, I'm a in rock. one of her songs, you guys. <gasps> you are? Oh, that's right, because she's obsessed with The Office, because I remember Angela. Dun, dun. dun she loves dun, Angela. Da, 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 dun. Yeah. No, she loves me more than Angela. Are you kidding? I interviewed <laughs> her for the podcast 
No. She'll uh, she'll be coming up in an upcoming episode. My str- awesome. my strange addiction is related to her strange addiction was is her obsession with the office. Did you know yeah. that? Is that why you picked the question, or is that just dumb luck? Dumb luck. Oh, there you go. I should have remembered that. Billie Eilish. Let's edit that in there. Eilish. I, 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 I was just reading. <laughs> One of the best concerts I've yeah. ever been to. See, this is why I'm covering my face because I don't. I don't. I, I, All right. Actually, no. I can deadpan it. Go ahead. Uh, last question. What's the last question? Has Brian ever? had a fake id yes <sighs> traveling into these Shh. chair what were they doing cherubing cherubing in chicago like a, you need a yeah, fake id yeah, for that like, yeah yeah no oh, that's a that's a straight face i think you fear authority too much or you feared yeah that's authority. the question was he a rule follower as a kid okay i wouldn't think that cherubs would be drinking but he literally said he was like you're you're given like freedom when you shouldn't have he freedom. elected that was to, he elected to cut his f- leg in half yeah this guy's a risk taker yeah yeah <laughs> you are horrible <laughs> you are horrible for Amanda. yes i had multiple but i didn't drink in high school i didn't drink in high school but oh college, once we got yeah. to college yes um yeah yes i did all right let me see the other ones i'm gonna do them really right. quick what are they are they embarrassing things <laughs> on here have i ever been sent to the principal's office yes no i feel like you got away with it you hit I someone like with you your walk class and got in trouble and you got in trouble <laughs> uh i don't think i ever was sent to the principal's office no so now you're making a comeback yeah this um, is super bowl this is <laughs> have i ever looked him. inside my friend's medicine cabinet no. I think you've peaked. Doesn't everyone? Yeah, I mean, everyone peaks, right? <laughs> everyone peaks. <laughs> I thought I held you in higher regard than that. Does Do I have a creative name for their Wi-Fi? Does that mean like the... Oh, like they give you like, like a you pun know, Spectrum or something. 915, but you changed it to like Kev's oh. Palace. Oh, a crea- Kev's Palace. <laughs> or like <laughs> the best creative one name. <laughs> okay. Like at the airport, I once saw man's not hotspot. <laughs> okay. All right. That would be a creative name. So I'm going to say no. By the way, I've taken over this podcast. Is this a problem? Literally, I've taken over. They've stopped recording. Anarchy. Everything. Go ahead. Um, Based on the fact that you were confused, I'm going to go with no. Yeah, no. Well, this is a creative name for their Wi-Fi. I, I didn't know. So that maybe that you have like my Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> no, Would we call it creative? That. It's Kev's Palace. Do I have any magazine subscriptions? Currently? Or have you ever? Like Golf USA or something? Have any magazines? It's called Golf sub- Digest. That first one. Of all. <laughs> uh, not anymore. No, you don't. No. Do you, does anyone? You have to be you a collector. You say no. Is there anybody else? I think you subscribe to the New Yorker. I said Golf USA. Or whatever, something oh, like that. Amanda's trying to get no, real specific. No, she, no, she, I, she she's getting you? close. It's this not, is Super Bowl 51. It is not. Patriots are making a comeback no, third quarter. Re- no, I mean, she's really been perfect. It's not the New Yorker, but you get, it's Vanity Fair. I like reading Vanity Fair in my hand on the airplanes. And so oh. I was finally like, why am I spending $92 in every airport, whatever they call it? Hudson <laughs> News. Hudson News. <laughs> so okay. I got a subscription. Well, we didn't even talk about Cameo. Guys, we got a ton of business. Thank you so much for joining me this week um, uh, on the Vile Files. I uh, I will be here now, starting next week, every week, uh, asking these questions. Ever had a crazy roommate? Have I ever had a crazy roommate? You have. You've had a roommate you didn't like. Uh, now, see, the, you see how he does this. I tried to answer. He's like, define crazy. I don't know. I'm reading the question that's right here. Have uh, ever had a crazy roommate? I've, yes, and you're. You didn't like a roommate, and you said they were crazy. I would just go with yes, because if he was traveling that much for theater, he's got to have like random hotel roommates every freaking night. There's got to be some crazy people in theater. I don't think this is right, but I want to say that you were the crazy roommate. Oh, oh God. you know what? She was making a comeback, and now we're done. Now we're done with her. Now we're done. No, and by the way, when you you don't bunk up with strangers when you do College? theater. Oh, was what there, in the uh, hell was that? When you're on like a you bus tour, it's to a room. To a, two to a room? Yeah, you each have one of the queen no. beds. Fuck no. No, I don't know. No. 
What is this? I didn't know you were like the prince of theater. Like maybe you get your own, but. I feel like I did a great job yeah, describing I mean, myself as the did, prince of theater. I mean, maybe he was. He was in, came to LA and it's like, I'm here to do one of the greatest shows of all time. There you go. Uh, Brian, this has been a real pleasure. Uh, thank you for. Are you lying? Are you being serious or are you lying? Has well, it been a, how much of a pleasure? I don't, oh, amazing. Oh, okay. All right. Do you, Fine. Do She's you, all pissed because we've taken too long. No, it's okay. I'm just uh, I'm I'm Her texting back. and she's, doing the doing the bad, work cop. part. It's been a real pleasure. <laughs> Thank you it's so been much. A lot of fun. Thanks for having um, me on. I appreciate that. I like the questions. Be sure to listen to Brian's podcast. A uh, uh, deep is it Office Deep Dive? Deep Dive off the, the Office, office deep, deep Dive. It's really good. Uh, I'm four episodes deep in it. If you are an Office fan at all, you will love the conversations you you interview. <laughs> Pretty much the whole ensemble of yeah. cast. And the next three weeks, uh, John Krasinski uh, will be on next week. Uh, his movie, Quiet Place 2, is opening next week as well, uh, followed by uh, Jenna Fisher, I believe, and uh, and Mr. Steve Carell. It's so, so we've got a great uh, lineup here coming up the next yeah. few weeks. It's a really fun. You, it's the stories you guys share, the intimate. It's It, it feels like. You know, listening, eavesdropping on two friends, kind of reminiscing about the past. So it's a, it's a lot of fun. Be sure to check that out. Thanks for listening, guys. Uh, don't forget to send your questions at asknickacastmedia.com. Cast with a K for Ask Nick episodes. And uh, if there's nothing else, we will see you back on Monday. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you.